Uh, well, I guess we can start with the last seminar of this academic year. For this occasion, we have the Dr. Greg Jackson, who got his PhD from the Un Bernard University in 2020. Uh, now, now he's a postdoc in the INT University of Washington, uh, and soon will join in a other postdoc in France. I don't remember the university, sorry for that. Uh, he will be talking about the coherent part and energy lost. And thank you, Greg, for, for coming. And... Sure. Uh, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, some mechanism in, uh, in QCD that has to do um, with energy loss, and I'm going to explain. Oh, could you maybe hide the? Um... I'm trying to do it, so I don't know why it's working. Oh, <laughs> Just ignore it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't think it will overlap with anything. Yes. Um, so um, the 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 energy loss mechanism I'm going to be talking about is relevant for. Um, for proton nucleus collisions, um, it's an effect that has uh, can be derived from from first principles and involves some some perturbation theory. So I'm going to tell you basically some of the uh, kind of rigorous uh, derivation, uh, not all the details, but I'm going to try to give you a physical idea of what's going on, um, and I am then going to present a bit of uh, phenomenology with these two kind of. Uh, energy regimes, collider experiments, and all the way up to cosmic rays. So let me get started. Um, I have to click. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so the, the, conceptually, this problem is uh, really simple. Um, it's basically a question. Um, you have some block of matter. doesn't really matter what the, the matter is. But uh, you have a parton then that moves through it, so let's say a quark or a gluon. And because of the presence of the medium and its interactions, this parton can somehow lose energy. And let's say that that happens over in an ideal in an idealized situation that happens over some some length, and we have a break. Of course, that's not what we have not set up we have in nature. But um, the 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 main message I'm going to tell you in this talk is that if you have that situation where you have a parton initially comes through this medium and then exits with some reduced energy, the dominant uh, regime of energy loss is something called fully coherent energy loss. And so I'm going to introduce a, an acronym here, FCL, and I'm probably going to use that several times. And uh, it's something that dominates at very, very large energies because the average energy loss turns out to be proportional to the energy. So there are many regimes, and I'm going to um, describe some of them and indicate what makes this one unique. But let me already give you kind of a parametric idea of the formula. The average energy loss is proportional to the energy, and it involves a ratio of a soft scale to a hard scale. And then there's also the strong coupling constant, which is something you need so that the, the parton actually couples to the medium. And uh, the, the soft scale is the numerator, and that's something like the, um, the, the saturation momentum. I'm going to explain a bit more of what that is. And the denominator is some hard transverse um, mass that can be measured and has to do with the kick that resolves the parton. So let's start with um, very basic conceptual ideas, things that are discussed in electromagnetism textbooks. And that is if you have um, sequential scatterings, you can use these linard wichert potentials and uh, consider what happens if you have a charge that moves at some velocity undergoes a scattering and then redirects what is the radiation associated with that, the radiation spectrum of intensity as a function of energy and solid angle. And uh, it has this classic formula where you have a difference, a kind of a difference of two currents before and after. And if you do the same thing with two scatterings, what you find is that there's this interference term. Okay, so I can use this over here. And this interference term involves a phase. And the phase is important because what emerges from that phase is you have an e to the i omega times some characteristic time scale, 
And that characteristic time scale is known as the formation time. And that's important for separating out some regimes because if, um, if this formation time is very large, then you have, um, as in the large compared to the distance between the, basically the mean free path, if you assume that these are moving at some fixed velocity, then this term um, uh, goes, to, goes approximately to zero and you have the suppression of radiation. And that's something that has been known for a very long time. And uh, right. so um, the, the way to deal with that is something is uh, basically you, um, because of this finite formation time, the parton can only resolve a certain number of scatterings. So you have to, if you have a block of matter of size L, you have to only have a certain number of resolutions that the scattering center can see. And each of these scattering centers then induces radiation approximately independently as um, as if they were separate scatterings. And so this has been derived for QED, where it's actually known as the LPM effect, derived in the 50s. It stands for landau pomerinchuk migdal effect. And then it's also been done for QCD by many other authors more in the 90s, the VDMPSZ group. And uh, the result is very similar, but there's an important distinction between going from Q QED to QCD, and that is that a gluon that passes through the medium doesn't have to actually have its momentum deflected considerably in order to radiate like in electromagnetism. You need that momentum kick in order to have radiation. But for, for a colored part on a QCD, you can have some kind of rotation and then the part on continues moving, but a gluon is still being radiated. So there are a bunch of these different regimes which I've spoken about, and they're all kind of separated by the formation time. So if the formation time is very, very small, then you then every single scattering in the whole medium just acts as an independent uh, scatterer or the the, the the kind of test part on that's moving through. And as this um, formation time goes up, and that has to do with the actual energy of the radiation spectrum you're talking about, then you go into this uh, LPM, LPM regime where you have to collect certain groups of scatterers over the mean free path. And then when the formation time is very, very, very large, then basically, and the entire medium just looks like a point scatterer. And uh, that's the coherent energy loss regime I'm talking about. And so, of course, the question in phenomenology, you know, which one is more important? That depends on many things. It depends on the process and the type of radiation. Um, and it's often summarized in this kind of plot of the spectrum as a function of the radiation fre uh, frequency. So omega is basically the energy of radiation and um, I is the intensity differential with respect to omega. So assuming this is sort of a, a constant, um, well, it's proportional to the coupling strength and some kinematics there. So in the beta height regime, it's approximately constant. And when you get to the LPM suppression, it goes down. And then when you get to the fully coherent regime, it uh, decreases even more. But this is actually only a, in a specific situation, which is frequently discussed in heavy ion collisions, and that's where you have a jet or some kind of initial hard scattering that produces a particle that then interacts with the medium. And I want to distinguish that from another situation that I'm discussing today, which is where you actually have a parton initially moving through the medium and then being resolved by some, uh, some other parton, a hard kick that can actually resolve this, and then the multiple scatterings inducing some radiation. So it's a subtle difference, but you're going to see why it's important later. Basically, in the in this situation where um, the fully coherent uh, regime emerges, um, it's sort of a it's a large log that comes up in the spectrum. So it's not completely flat, but over a very wide range up to the um, so E here is the total incoming parton's energy, and presumably it can't kind of radiate more energy than than it has to begin with. But the point of this um, fully coherent regime is that it radiates uh, the that the um basically the the height of the spectrum is lower but it extends out in a very wide range in energy so uh, because the photo right. formation time is proportional to energy right that's right yes well um i mean i'll certainly lhc energies are high enough and uh, cosmic ray energy is even higher. So 
that, those are the two um, kind of collider and uh, cosmic rays, what I'm going to be talking about. Just to um, give an idea where this large log actually comes from. So the, um, the simplest case of just having a, a parton kind of scattering on a static uh, center that was calculated many years ago by uh, Brunion and Birch, and they found the differential spectrum. So this is the these are the Feynman diagrams, and you have some some radiation spectrum which is differential with respect to the energy and the transverse momentum of the radiated gluon. And if you integrate over the transverse momentum of the of the gluon radiation, you actually find that you get a kind of log of the the lower integration to the upper integration. So that's the hard and soft scale. And I'm going to explain what those are in the in what I'm in the situation I'm discussing. So where you have, as I've shown in red, the initial hard parton coming through and being resolved by some stepping scattering center, and then having some other some other process in the medium um, induce the induce the radiation. So here, Q Q perp is the hard scattering, and L is the uh, medium induced um, uh, scattering. And when you put those together, you find that the induced spectrum goes like a, a log, well, alpha s times a log, and the hard, uh, the the hard scale is the basically the invariant mass of the of the combined final state. And in the numerator, what you have is the um, um, the soft scale, which let me go back a little bit. So. Forgot to mention here when I was talking about the um, the LPM spectrum is that an important parameter that goes into it is something called the uh, um, jet quenching parameter. It's often called Q hat, and it's discussed all over the literature. It basically tells you if you know the formation time, that's the that's the transport coefficient you multiply in order to get the momentum broadening. Or if you have the um, for the coherence spectrum. You multiply it by the length of the medium, assuming this is traveling at approximately the speed of light. And that, so what appears in the numerator is basically the momentum broadening that the medium produces. So this is, yeah. I think, the main slide, right? So when you when you have yeah. very large, you know, uh, formation time, right? Presumably all the scatterings contribute equally, right? To, this, uh, to the production of the photon or glue or whatever. Um, not, not exactly. There's no, but, but, right? This, uh, the important thing is, that, I mean, you see, every time, so what I'm going to move on to now is actually where you have arbitrarily many of these soft scatterings. Mm -hmm. And what makes that complicated is that each time this static scattering center attaches to some parton, you have color factors, which do not commute. And so every diagram looks very different. And uh, there's no phase factors within there, right? Ah, uh, uh, the phase factor. No, there is no phase factor. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So this black one is outside of the medium, right? Uh, no, no, no. The the yeah. black one is is inside the medium. What is outside the medium is actually this emission of the radiated gluon. So how do you distinguish between the black and the green uh, and the black and red exchange gluons? Um, basically, the the um, so the black one has to be. The, the transverse momentum is much smaller than the Q per. So what this is a this is kind of um, you know in we're when we're discussing the underlying hard process and sort of radiation induced on top of that, the, the underlying hard process is this Q per scattering. So if you don't have that, then um, then it doesn't even get resolved by the medium. So you need that in the first place, and then we're kind of discussing uh, radiation on top of that. So the, uh, just to go back. You know the intensity is given by the matrix element squared, including radiation to the elastic corresponding elastic process. So the elastic process here, um, the elastic process is the red process, basically. Where well, can we have two two hard scatterings? Um, you can, but this is this is power suppressed. So, um, power, yeah. power of momentum. Power of the hard scattering. So basically, there will be if you have another hard scattering, there will be another one over Q per squared here. Mm -hmm. So that has to do with the kind of factorization mm -hmm. of um, cross sections in QCD. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, of course, the, the the conclusion to draw here is is quite non-trivial. There are there are many steps, and that was um, 
it was kind of realized about 10, 10 years ago that, that yeah. this um that this large log existed and it was derived in several um formalisms by the authors here and the key points are summarized in in bullet points and that is that you know you have so you have what i've called x and y and x and y are distinguished by the fact that you have a gluon emitted prior to entering the medium and you have a gluon emitted after the medium i'm going to so here is the medium, there's the medium gluon four, gluon after. In, in the medium, it cancels out, right? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. So, yeah, so, well, parts of it cancel out. The part that doesn't cancel out is actually the interference term. So, and there's an important reason for that, and it has to do with color. <laughs> so okay. I mentioned before that there are some complicated color facts that come out here. Basically, it would cancel in QED, and that's actually that was derived um, many many years ago. Um, but in QCD, you have color contributions that that kind of preserve this large log, and you'll you'll see exactly what happens in a slide or two. Uh, yes, I think that's what I wanted to say. Right. So let me kind of give you the the um, formula for the induced spectrum, and I'm just illustrating a particular process where this would be relevant for a proton nucleus collision. So it's indicated in the rest frame of the nucleus. You have this nucleus and a proton comes in. And for a hard scattering, you basically have a kind of QC, PQCD factorization where the uh, parton distribution function in the proton sources some parton that then moves through and scatters on another parton in the nucleus. Um, and when this happens, you can have the multiple soft scatterings. And I've indicated those with the blue, the blue dotted lines. And it's very complicated to, <laughs> to resum all of those and figure out what happens. And I don't wouldn't really help in this talk. So I'm just going to tell you what the result is. And the result is that when you when you do that resummation on top of this underlying hard process and a gluon gets emitted. So I haven't actually shown the, the emit gluon, but the let's just look at the formula before I talk about uh, that. The formula involves this large logarithm, uh, actually. Yes. Okay, so the formula involves a large log, and the physics of that large log is actually can be understood relatively simply in terms of the transverse momentum of the radiation. So it emerges from two limits of integration. I mentioned this kind of Q1, Q2 limit of integration, and the lower limits of integration basically says that the, this radiation cannot actually probe the final state of the parton. So for example, in this case, you have a QQ bar quark in the final state, and the radiated gluon doesn't really see the separate quarks. All it sees is, oh, either this is in a singlet configuration or it's in an octet configuration. That's all that you can get. Um, and the uh, so the upper limits on the transverse momentum integration tells you that the, the wavelength can actually resolve all these multiple self-scatterings, and that's what sets the hard scale. So you get this ratio of two scales, which emerges from the physics, which we call the sort of point-like Dijet approximation. And then the other important point of this um, formula is the prefactor. So of course there's an alpha S, no surprise, but there's this combination of uh, Casimir factors. And you can understand that from uh, the factor, you can understand because it comes from um, the interference term. So I put that here. You get the interference term between pre-emission and post-emission. And if you look at the kind of um, generators in certain representations that you can find, you have a TAR1, that's for coming from parton number one, which in this case is a gluon, but it could be anything. And then it couples to the final states in the interference term. So if you rewrite this combination of the um, generators, you get, so it's just a kind of complete the squares trick, and you get a combination of Casimir's, which involves the sum of the, whatever part on one is, in this case, it's a gluon. So C1 is N. And uh, then of course, uh, the customer of R minus C2. So in this case, C1 and C2 are the same because they're both gluons, but CR is the customer of the singlet or the octet. So in the singlet case, the customer is zero. In the octet case, it's F. And uh, you can do that for different kinds of processes. Actually, it's a bit simpler if you if you are considering just a two to one process. In this case, it's two to two. But for two to one processes, you when you look at these factors, so for example, gluon fusion to a gluon 
the prefector comes out having different, uh, well, it depends on the process, but actually the sign can even vary. So I called this energy loss at the beginning, but maybe that was a bad name because if you have a ne negative spectrum, that means energy gain. So it's more like energy modification depending on the kind of color configuration of the underlying hard process. Um, but I'll continue to call it energy loss because that's what people have been calling it. Okay, so just to um, compare and contrast with the LPM energy loss, which is something that people discuss a lot in heavy ion collisions because it's important for jets. Parametrically, the LPM energy loss is actually constant with energy, but it goes like this Q hat times L squared. So it's sort of momentum broadening proportional to L S. Whereas this um, FCL energy loss is proportional to the energy. It involves some combination of color factors, which is interesting. But the important distinction here is that the coherent energy loss needs color in the initial and final state so that you have, can have this interference. And it's very, it's more important at larger energies. So for example, the, yeah, I already said that uh, for, for a parton that suddenly gets accelerated like a jet, it's not gonna be relevant. And also for anything involving weak processes. So deep in elastic scattering or electroweak boson production, there's not going to be so this. Compare this energy loss with beta hydrogen. I think beta hydrogen is also proportional to energy, right? That's right. But um, yeah. It also all oh. as well. That's right. Uh, but if I can just go back to this here, right. So the cutoff on the sort of energy of a beta hydrogen is that once the, once the formation time is larger than the mean free path, then it's, um, and the mean free path is quite small in this case. So the argument is kind of what, you know, it's a sort of integrated spectrum versus uninterpreted. So it might appear like a uh, beta hydro regime, right? Yes, it is actually very similar to the beta hydro regime, which is maybe not too surprising because the beta hydro regime is kind of just independent scatterings. But there's an important difference, and that is the appearance of this Q hat parameter, because the Q hat contains information about the medium. It's a property of the medium. Um, yeah, so maybe I don't want to go into too many of these details now in the interest of time. But the thing I'm I'm going to show you some results for cross sections. And the important point of the in of the spectrum is that it allows you to relate um the, for example, the proton, uh, the, the PA cross section for a collision to the PP cross section. And that is usually done in terms of uh, not just some energy shift, but actually a probability distribution that tells you how to weight the energy. Um, and so what you can construct from the induced spectrum is something called the quenching weight. And then basically, if you know the PP cross-section, you can calculate the PA cross-section or vice versa. And this quenching weight is given in terms of a, well, a, it's a probability distribution, which is something you can check. Uh, it's basically portable to the induced spectrum times some kind of pseudocode factor that you don't have any more radiation. It's uh, it's a model. It's just one that's very commonly used. So, um, And in order to calculate it, you need the, the induced spectrum. And uh, this, tells, this tells you how to shift the energy, but um, typically the interesting observable is actually the rapidity of the particle. That's what they meant at LHC, for example, or in terms of the Feynman, uh, Feynman X variable, which is basically the ratio of the uh, light cone energies. And uh, I think I just had some complicated formula about you know, how to actually implement this. Right, so these maybe these details are not so important. I can skip over that. But just to explain the expectation of what will happen, if, for example, at LHC, we're looking at things in terms of rapidity and we have uh, some energy shift, which manifests as a rapidity shift. Well, you have some kind of cross section, d sigma dy, that gets measured. That's in black. Um, in the PP collision, it's going to be symmetric, and uh, this kind of shift tells you you move that one way, and then it has some weight, so it gets reduced. And then you take the ratio of these two things, and then you get something called the nuclear modification factor RPA, which is measured, and that is. Um, that is measured as a function of rapidity, and you can kind of see by looking at the curves that it has this kind of weird S or curve sort of step shape. So that is the expectation, um, very roughly speaking, of course, because there are lots of details. I mentioned things about color states and uh, the kinematics is a bit more complicated. So those are two important um, quantities that dictate the kind of coherent energy loss. 
So the divert being in some color state, I spoke about QQ bar production, and there you have a singlet or an octet. And um, there's also this energy fraction. So of course, we don't measure these things in experiment, but in principle, they are observable quantities. And the, right. So the in order to implement the, these in a calculation, you need to kind of project the cross-section into a given color representation. And that depends on the kinematics or this, this uh, energy fraction of the two parton, two partons psi. And uh, so I've given there an ex sort of, so uh, the differential cross-section is given as a, a weighted integral over the probability uh, to be in a certain representation, and then you sum over all available representations. So the sigma dy is the inclusive project production. That's right, yes. Yes, and um, yeah. So on the right-hand side, you actually have it sort of um, in a fixed color representation, which is not measured, but we weight it by the given probabilities. And so you can calculate these by actually projecting the matrix element onto that given kind of... Um, irreducible representation in color subspace. Um, for example, you can have, in, in the case of having two partons in the final state, you could have, um, so QQ bar I mentioned already, but you could have a quark and a quark, for example, and then you have uh, triplet and sextet, and then you could have quark and gluon, and then you can get 15 plets, and if you have two gluons, you can get all the way up to 27 plet. So this is all very interesting, and you can calculate these um, probabilities, and that's what we have done. So I just show you some some plots, but maybe we can come back to that because the details are not too important. Um, and then I mentioned that this is all at the leading logarithm because there's one large log. When you want to go beyond that log, you actually need to find out that the radiation can start to probe the two individual partons, and you can get these kind of transitions between um, color subspaces. So that's something we're working on, and I might come back to that uh, later on. It involves things like projecting into the different subspaces. So it's very fun calculations. Let me um, let me not dwell on this too much, but I just wanted to have a slide that um, gives you some details about kinematics. So I've shown a bunch of processes. On the bottom, you actually see electroweak processes, deep in elastic scattering, and um, uh, electroweak boson production. So neither of these actually relevant for coherent energy loss. It's the top two that are going to be relevant. And the top left one is showing you kind of Quarkonia production production when you have, um, say, an incoming gluon that splits into a QQ bar pair, undergoes a hard scattering, and then they um, combine into the uh, J psi or something like that. Um, in, the set, in the top right, you just see, a, for example, gluon-gluon fusion, and then producing a light hadron, which is the dominant mechanism there. And I here give you, so just to quantify what we mean by large energy, so the momentum fractions of the incoming partons x1 and x2 can be expressed basically by an exponential of the rapidity divided by the invariant energy. So, um, so when square root s is very, very big, x1 and x2 are very small, so we start to probe the distribution functions of small momentum fractions. And um, well, at least one of them, you see, uh, when the rapidity is large or small, I have one of x1, x2 will be small. Right. So, yes. Speaking of um, small x1 and x2, there's another nuclear effect which is well known, and that is uh, parton distribution functions get modified when it's a uh, uh, a nucleon inside a nucleus, as opposed to just a nucleon, so a proton. And um, these nuclear parton distribution functions are a huge, huge industry by themselves. There are lots of people working on that. And that can also have the same effect that I've been mentioning. In other words, suppressing the cross-section of a PA collision with, res uh, with respect to a PP collision, just because the distribution function of a parton inside the nucleus is different from a parton inside a nucleon. Um, so we have these two kind of main effects um, that people have been looking at. And they're, of course, they're both relevant. Um, and they both have different regimes in which one dominates over the other. And I'm, of course, not going to present results about the nuclear PDFs. Um, that's been going for a lot longer than this uh, FCEL business. 
but I do want to mention a bit later on how how these two effects talk to one another because um, it's important that you have both of them at the same time and not just one, not just the other. But having said that, I am just going to focus on the fully coherent energy loss as a kind of, um, uh, you know, um, sort of yeah, base baseline uh, baseline phenomenology. What is the impact of this? Is it large? Is it negligible? Um, is it somewhere in between? And that was first done. So when when this um, FCL regime was identified, it was done for quarkonia and then light hadrons and uh, open heavy flavor and neutrinos are what I'm going to focus on. But uh, I think the conclusion is basically the same between all these observables. And uh, the idea is just to have some very simple assumptions. Don't want to make a very, very complicated uh, setup, but assume some model for the proton-proton cross-section. It's, be, it's been measured. All we need is the form of it. We don't need to have a PQCD prediction for it. If we have the form of it, then we can use the quenching weight I mentioned earlier and calculate the PA cross-section. So basically, provided we have a good enough model for the PP cross-section, we can use the fully coherent energy loss to calculate the PA cross-section and see if it matches with what has been measured. And uh, we also have some simplifying assumptions just to um, implement the important parameters in FCL. Basically, the main one is the quenching weight, uh, the quen, sorry, the uh, transport coefficient Q hat. And that has been studied to death, basically. And it's quite well known that there are various parameterizations and there is an uncertainty as you go to smaller and smaller x. But the, this, um, this kind of uh, power x to the x to the power minus one third is more or less what people use in, in the community. And there is a well-measured prefactor. But um, I will show you uncertainty bands in the next few slides, and those uncertainty bands come from varying all of these parameters. So there's some uncertainty associated with Q hat, with the exponents, and um, also with the path length that the parton moves. So, for example, if you have a big nucleus like gold, you can you can estimate based on approximately where the parton crosses what what L will be, and if for gold or lead, it's going to be about ten fermi. And if you don't have presumably depends on the size of the nucleus. Um, it does not actually Q Q naught hat. You say Q naught hat. Yes. No. This is this is um actually Q naught hat is basically proportional to the gluon distribution inside the nucleus. So, so proportional to the lengths. Yeah, yeah. So that's so yeah. So the the uh, momentum broadening is is maybe I can just write that here. The momentum broadening. So basically delta p per squared is approximately q hat times l. So q hat is modeled in this way and l is modeled with the, the with the Galvin model. So basically this is this is a 10 Fermi, let's say, and q hat, which has a uh, units g v squared, that's it's um clearly yeah it gets it gets larger for for x being smaller and yeah. So it is proportional to, to L, that's right. But q hat zero q hat zero is not. It's just a uh, Quantity that can be associated to the uh, gluon distribution function. Right. So I th think, yes, as I mentioned before, this is excluding all the nuclear power distribution function effects. Um, and let's see what it looks like. So here I'm showing you um, QQ bar production, um, assuming a kind of uh, taking two gluons that fuse and then make a QQ bar pair. Presumably because X1 or X2 is small, the um, gluon distribution is going to be the one that dominates as opposed to having, say, two, a Q, a light, two light quarks coming together and forming a heavy heavy quark pair. Um, in this case, it is the meson production. So the heavy quark is a charm quark. Um, and here, you see the nuclear modification factor as a function of rapidity measured at uh, LHCb. So LHCb can go out to about uh, two to four units of rapidity. That's here. These are the measurements. And um, I forget if it's at least or CMS, but that's what produces this mid-rapidity value as a sign 
larger error bar. But this is kind of the, what LHC was, LHC B was designed to do. So you have your backward rapidity and forward rapidity. You remember I said FCL is going to dominate at the larger rapidity. So you really want to focus on this kind of this window over here at large rapidity. And um, I'm showing it in some, some different values of B perp. That was the hard scale that appears. And what you can see is that the um, the baseline prediction, which has some some error estimate, which is actually quite small, like you know ten percent or, or less, um, within that uncertainty, the suppression is about half, so it doesn't go through the data points. That's uh, not failure, and it's not really a surprise because we already know that there are nuclear mod mod modifications to part of distribution functions. Um, but the crucial aspect of um, FCL is that it's predicted from first principles and the uncertainty is rather insensitive to variations in the parameters. So it's a, you know, it's a conservative calculation, but the, the coupling is weak because we're at very high energy. So it should be fairly well under control. Um, right. And the other plot here I want to show you is just the PT distribution. So you see it has more or less the same shape. This is Kind of and in a particular forward rapidity, then my conclusion is basically the same. The trend is very similar. Um, right. So speaking of the nuclear power distribution functions, here's one of the latest determinations of how they look as a function of x, um, the momentum fraction, and the first one I always look to is the <laughs> gluon distribution here. Um, these are actually the ratios. So these aren't the distributions themselves, but these are kind of the ratios with respect to the uh, proton case. And it's well known that for small x, the proton case blows up. But the important thing is the uncertainties here are still quite large. So we're going sort of between about 0.6 to 0.4. Um, the distinction between the curves, there's a blue curve and an orange curve. And the uncertainty in the orange curve is much smaller. And the reason for that is because they include the previous measurement I showed. So they include this measurement, and that measurement of D mesons basically shrinks the error band. So it's like marvelous, right? We have shrunk the error band by including these new measurements. Um, in general, these come from you know global fits of many, many observables, electroweak observables. Uh, there's a whole bunch of things that go in there. Um, but the point. I want to make here is that um, these global fits assume there is no other physics. So they assume that any nuclear modification we see is entirely due to modified distribution functions. And distribution functions kind of assume factorization. So factorization is a theorem that tells you that you can use PQCD cross sections and multiply them by uh, the distribution function and do some kinematic integrals to get the result. And maybe I should uh, mention that the coherent energy loss is something that explicitly breaks factorization because it has to do with interference between final and initial state radiation. Um, but if these things are actually going to be happening together, then what uh, what the extraction on the previous slide has been, oops. So the orange bands here are basically this function that you extract if you assume that that's the only effect. Whereas in reality, we have this energy loss, which will affect then the pylon distribution function that you get extracted. And so the idea here is that while well, you're, you know, the the results on the previous page may have very small uncertainties, but if you're, you know, if they're extracting the wrong quantity, then it's not going to be very useful. And um, that's why that's in fact why they show these two things separately because the LHCb D meson data is slightly controversial in the sense of it's shrinking the error bars, but you know because hadronization is complicated and there are these cold nuclear matter effects like energy loss, we don't really know if that's a controllable effect. So let me yes, I think that's all I want to say about the cosmic uh, the collider energies. Let me move on to cosmic rays. And cosmic rays are good for coherent energy loss because they're at even higher energies. So, um, well, what are cosmic rays in the first place? You have some, some 
proton that comes in at very high energy and collides with a, a nucleus in the atmosphere, uh, basically oxygen and nitrogen uh, with some average atomic number, and it's a PA collision, basically. So it's not it's not gold or lead, which are big nuclei, it's smaller nuclei. But the interesting thing about the coherent energy loss is that the scaling with atomic number is actually very weak. It's like A to the one-sixth power. So we actually expect that this FCL effect is basically going to be the same across a very wide wide range of uh, nuclei. Um, and so why not use it to see what happens for, for cosmic ray spectra? And for example, something people at IceCube are very interested in are cosmic neutrinos. So they have a great neutrino telescope. But in order to use it well, they need to understand the background. And the main background for them are neutrinos that stem from cosmic rays striking the atmosphere and showering uh, causing a hadronic shower, which of course produces some neutrinos. So for them, do they want to see cosmic neutrinos, so they want to subtract these atmospheric neutrinos. And in fact, if we have this idea that the cross section gets modified by part on energy loss, in fact, this background should be slightly smaller than than they than one might naively expect without any energy loss effects. So let's go through and see what. Um, what the impact is. Well, first I should show you here that these are, so here you see the, neutri the well, neutrino and lepton fluxes as a function of energy. And um, so these are like um, 10, you know, 10 to the five, 10 to the six, 10 to the seven GeV. So very high energies. Um, that's the energy of the, I mean, the, now the picture is roughly correct because the nucleus in the atmosphere is more or less at rest and you have this high energy uh, neutrino coming in. Um, this is actually quite an old plot. So more recent studies that have been made by people solving a uh, kind of couple of cascade equations for the air shower produce something like this, where you can disentangle all the separate components due to different uh, meson decays. And the while the initial picture is the same, the only difference is that you have some the only thing that can produce uh, the neutrinos is a semi-leptonic decay. So we have exactly the same process I was talking about before. And then whatever hadron gets produced could be a e meson, for example, that undergoes some kind of semi-leptonic decay. And in fact, the um, the neutrinos that come from D mesons are quite interesting. People want to try and identify that component because it's called the prompt uh, neutrino flux. The rest of the so it turns out that there's a very interesting relation between light, uh, light mesons and, and heavy mesons in this cosmic ray business. And that's because the although the D mesons are actually very short lived in the lab, when they get boosted to such high energies, they actually have a, uh, the, their lifetime is kind of elongated enough so that they can interact with the atmosphere before they decay. So they can participate in the air shower in an interesting way. And so the D mesons here are shown by orange, they have this kind of bump that rises and for very high energies, as I, as I indicated, they have a significant contribution and start to dominate over the light meson contribution. So that's that's interesting, but uh, of course the coherent energy loss will affect both of them. So people at the LHC are actually proposing to have a, a light oxygen run. Um, and well, one of the reasons to look at that among many others is because of the relevance for cosmic ray air showers. And so here I'm showing you a kind of prediction of what they might see in terms of the nuclear modification factor. If they do it at five, um, sorry, if they do it at the proposed 10 TeV, then the uh, corresponding energy of the cosmic ray would be about 10 to the seven GeV. So it puts it sort of right somewhere like here in terms of the uh, relevant energies, right. And as you can see, sort of significant, uh, significant reduction order 10 to 20 percent depending on the rapid rapidity um, and doesn't change too much for D mesons and light hadrons so what we can do is right um, there is thankfully a very useful approximation to solving these cascade equations which is known as the method of Z moments and it basically involves factorizing the whole cascade into certain sub processes and these are the Z moments are called um, Z, and then they have a subscript of whatever interaction is happening. 
and it basically involves factorizing the so here you can see that the neutrino flux is expressed in terms of the cosmic ray flux of protons multiplied by some weird combination of z factors and the z factors here basically you get some and they're they're dimensionless and they go sort of between zero and one and this is the z factor for um the basically the hadron generation, which can subsequently then have a semi-leptonic decay. And then you have maybe some division factor for proton regeneration because this air shower is quite a complicated process. But these Z factors are expressed in terms of weighted integrals over the cross section. So we can actually find a plan of attack to implement our coherent energy loss. And uh, the plots, sorry, the plot at the bottom is just the cosmic ray, cosmic ray flux that has been measured by many different experiments. Um, so basically the point is that the plots I showed you before of the neutrino flux, oops, these plots of the neutrino flux are somehow proportional to this cosmic ray flux with some factors that shift and rearrange momentum depending on how the air shower can develop. And this, uh, this, cosmic, uh, this cosmic ray flux has an approximate power law shape. So it goes like e to the minus some power where that power is called the um, spectral index and the spectral index is known to go about between three and four or so. So using kind of that approximation, we can actually implement energy loss. The convenient variable here is a uh, Feynman X rescaling variable. And okay, there's some, some blah, blah, blah here. But basically you can calculate a modification factor. I called it R nu here. And it's basically basically the same thing as RPA, but for neutrinos. So you take the neutrino flux, assuming energy loss, and divide it by the neutrino uh, by the neutrino flux without any energy loss or the corresponding z moments. And what you find is that the, this quantity is approximately some some integral over some variables times the probability distribution in terms of some scaling variable. So it's basically a moment. It's a moment of some distribution function. So it's a kind of nice pocket formula that one can use. And if you do that, you come up with these plots. So this is basically a nuclear modification factor, but for neutrino fluxes. And here as a function of the relevant energies. So conventional guys, just by the way, these are the light, light mesons that induce some semi-leptonic uh, decays in the prompt of the heavy, heavier ones. And um, the heavier ones dominate at higher energy. So these plots are kind of shifted with respect to one another. And in both the relevant energy ranges, you can see that the suppression is sort of between, I don't know, 10 and 20% again. And there are a bunch of curves here that basically the only difference between them is having more complicated or more fancy uh, cosmic ray fluxes and, or, or changing the underlying photonic process. Um, yes, and the so the X2 is actually what you see on the top top axis. So you can see we're probing quite small momentum fractions of the X2, which is the target uh, nucleus in the atmosphere. So that kind of brings me uh, to the summary. Um, so I've spoken a bit about fully coherent energy loss uh, from uh, why it's sort of what the, what the physics mechanism that's going on there is. I've uh, then moved on and spoken about two different uh, observables and some phenomenology for them and why this energy loss is important. Um, and actually, you can see here, it's not the last page because I also have a preview. So the preview is that we have very recently gone beyond the leading logarithm, so done the next to leading log calculation. And I, it's not really out yet, but we we finished it, so I couldn't really resist and show you what it looks like. Now, instead of having uh, some some large uh, logarithm, you have some uh, basically, as I as I mentioned before, in the leading log um, calculation, the radiation cannot distinguish the final state partons, so it just sees the global color. When you go beyond leading log, of course, it can see the two different partons. So it talks to one and sometimes it talks to the other or induces a transition. And that's why you get two terms. And it's if you combine these two terms when the log is large, then you get the large log I mentioned and all these color factors. But in general, you get these very interesting kind of transition matrices. So one, two, three, and four are the, pro, uh, the partons for a two 
to scattering and you get so for example this this uh, matrix v alpha beta has to do with when the initial parton radiation couples to the parton three and alpha and beta here in the little circles are actually projection operators onto the relevant subspace so that's why these are kind of color transitions you then also get a hard scattering kernel which is another matrix in color space so alpha and beta here will go over whichever whichever irreducible representations are available, maybe a singlet or an octet, maybe a triplet or a sextet, anything like that. And you have to take a color trace over these matrices, multiply it together, and then that gets multiplied by this thing that sort of resembles a large logarithm, but not quite. That's just the approximate formula. The actual formula is a bit longer, so I don't show it here. And just to show you what those matrices look like, I wanted to show you the case for or gluon gluon scattering, gluon gluon scattering, but I couldn't put them on the page. So this one is just for for quark gluon scattering to quark gluon, where you have uh, you have um, three available color states. You have um, triplet, sextet, and fifteen plet, I think. Or yeah, and the matrices are quite big, but it's some kind of fun <laughs> thing to calculate them for all two to two processes, and uh, that's where I want to finish the talk. So thanks. Any questions from the audience? I have a question. Um, you showed us uh, the, the cross section for the inclusive neural production as a function of rapidity to the sigma dy, right? For, <clears throat> say, LHC energies. But there's a lot of data about well, the spectrum sigma dpt per total source for energy, right? Why wouldn't you compare the your model to this? I mean, I, I think for for RPA, I did look at both of them. You mean here the okay? They, they um actually the the great thing about what LHCb measured, they measured the cross section mm -hmm. differential with respect to PT bins and rapidity bins. So it's per per PT, right? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So so our mm -hmm. RPA here is the sigma d dp per dy. But this is the zero, right? Yes, d zero. Yeah. So there's a lot of data like um, for losing fluons, for pions, and Z0, and this side. Yeah, I, let me see. So, so the, um, uh, where do I want to go? I think I might have had some backup. Oh, maybe not. So those JPSI. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. So my, my, my question is that typically that if you want to describe the problem, at this kind of energies, that's the talk in the theory. At this kind of energies, there's a lot of what's going on in the P channel, right? Not only exchange of gluon, but there's a lot of uh, gluons being emitted, right? Like in a leather way uh, fashion, right? So, and this all contributes to the change of the, if you want to say, part of distribution functions, right? Nothing like that is included in the model, right? No, no, you're, you're right. That, that's, I mean, that's more of the factorization. And so I probably didn't emphasize this well enough, but the, everything I've spoken about here in terms of phenomenology is this energy loss effect. And because this energy loss effect has to do with the interference of radiation from the initial state to the final state, mm -hmm. it, uh, I mean, it's kind of some, some sort of entanglement between the two radiations, and it's not included in any factorization that you could do. Sure. It breaks that kind of thing. Absolutely. But, but you have um, this uh, phenomena of gluon emission that, they, that are not included in your inclusive gluon, but they emit it anyway, right? And they include it in the evolution of this distribution function. That's not distribution yeah, function, yeah, yeah. but whatever it is, right? And uh, what you what you what you've done is basically what we, I would call the dipole model. You know, I don't know how it's called these days, but when you have a color dipole moving through the medium, right, and scattering million times there, and you sum up all, all the stuff. Yeah, I mean, what the people that do that they don't normally consider radiation on top of that. Yeah. So that formalism is actually very difficult to calculate the energy loss spectrum. I think some people found a way to start to do that, but it's um, but you don't have to calculate energy loss, just uh, inclusive gluon production. Right. It's uh, not in that. Yeah, yeah, sure. But um, I mean, to, to, to include that as well as what we have done, 
you need to uh well that's actually one the, the reason we want to go beyond leading log right so when you have um it seems like this is okay this is just more complicated why does that help but in order to improve our phenomenology so that they can be included together we really need to do this because the the um the very simplistic assumption that we model the pp cross section we need to in order to go past that we need to actually calculate the pa cross section from pqcd and to do that we want to implement you know take Take this uh, this induced spectrum, use it to modify the matrix elements that you put in there, put in with the distribution functions that then get evolved to include all this extra radiation. So absolutely, they should all go in together. <laughs> um, and that would be the more most realistic thing. But uh, well, we're not we're not quite there yet. <laughs> Any other questions? Um... Here's your questions on the Simaldians. So I guess we can then correct. That's the one I think. So, into thousand one. Why? I 